section 1.6. We have seen that a linearly independent set S that generates a subspace W of V is uh, special in that every vector in W can be expressed in one and only one way as a linear combination of vectors in S. That was if S is linearly independent, we get the uniqueness of representation. So now we define a basis. A basis beta for a vector set V is a linearly independent subset of V that generates V. If beta is a basis for V, we also say that the vectors of beta form a basis for V. So basis is just the name now that we give a linearly independent subset that generates a subspace or that generates, uh, in the case of a basis, generates the entire vector space. This section leads us to a very important result that all bases for a vector space, for a finite dimensional vector space, have exactly the same number of elements in them. But it takes us a long time to get there, and there are uh, three proofs three theorems in here that will take quite a bit of time to get through, so we will divide uh, section 1.6 into two lectures. Um, some examples of a basis. Well, since the span of the empty set is the zero vector space, we could say that the basis for, for the basis for the zero subspace or vector space is the empty set. The standard basis for Rn you have seen many times and the standard basis is the easiest one to use is this one here. So for example the standard basis for R3 would be 100, zero, 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 010, zero, and 0, zero 001. <clears throat> and it's called the standard basis because it is so uh, easy to represent a 3-tuple in R3 as a linear combination of those vectors. A standard type basis for our m by n matrices with real coefficients is the set of E upper ij, meaning that all of the entries are zero except for the ijth. For example, m two by two, we see the usual basis here. And again, it's called standard because it's so easy to represent a matrix as a linear combination of these four matrices or vectors. A basis for the vector space of polynomials of degree less than or equal to n is clearly uh, 1, x, x squared, x cubed, up to x to the n. So, for example, um, in the vector space of polynomials uh, of degree less than or equal to 3, notice any polynomial that you write out is like 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus x plus 4, you see that it's uh, using the standard basis vectors, x squared, x cubed, x squared, x, and 1. A basis for all polynomials, the vector space of all polynomials, well, that's not finite. That is a, an infinite countable basis. You know that polynomial does stop. It's not like a series. It stops. You might have a 50th degree polynomial, and it would be a linear combination of the first 50 uh, vectors in that basis. So this is an example of an infinite dimensional vector space. So here's our first theorem. Beta is a basis for V containing those n vectors. If and only if each V in V can be uniquely expressed as a linear combination of the vectors in beta. So we have an if and only if statement here. We're going to have to do uh, two proofs going in either direction. So suppose that beta 
is a basis for v, and let v be any vector in v. Well, since beta is a basis, we know that there exist scalars a sub 1 through a n such that v is equal to a1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus and so on a sub n v the vector vn. Since beta is a basis we know those scalars exist. Well suppose there's another way to do it. This is always how you show uniqueness. Suppose there's two different possibilities. Suppose v is also equal to b1 v1 plus b2 v2 plus b sub n v n. And we have two different ways of representing v as a linear combination of the vectors in beta. Well, if I subtract then, I get the zero vector is equal to a1 minus b1 times the vector v1 plus a2 minus b2 the vector v2 plus plus uh, a n minus b n times the vector v n. Well, again, by our assumption that beta is a basis, we know that the vectors v1 through vn are linearly independent. So any time we can write 0 as a linear combination of <coughs> the vectors in beta, we know that this implies that the coefficients have to be 0. So a1 minus b1 must be equal to a2 minus b2 equals, and so on, the last coefficient, a sub n minus b sub n, they're all equal to zero. And of course that implies that <coughs> a sub i equals b sub i for i equals 1, 2 through n. The coefficients are the same in the two representations. So the linear combination is unique. Now we'll prove it the other way. Let's suppose that for every vector v in v, there are unique scalars such that v is a linear combination of the vectors in beta. We wish to show that beta is a basis. So what we need to show is that beta is linearly independent and that the span of beta is the vector space v. Well, by our assumption, since every v is a linear combination for vectors in beta, we know that the span of beta is v. So all we need to do is prove linear independence. And we always start that by uh, assuming, or if, uh, b1 v1 plus b2 v2, if there are scalars, b sub i's, such that this sum is equal to the zero vector, we now want to prove that the b sub i's must all be zero. Well, we know that b1 equals b2 equals dot 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 equals b sub n equals zero is a solution, obviously, and since we know that there are unique scalars for every vector in v, it must be, by uniqueness, this is the only solution. And if that is the only solution, we know that beta is linearly independent. So look at the theorem one more time and know what we proved. Uh, beta is a basis for v if and only if each element of the vector space can be uniquely expressed as a linear combination of the vectors in v. So the span of b is the vector space v and the representation as linear combinations is unique. 
Theorem 1.9 tells us that if a vector space V is generated by a finite set S, then some subset of S is a basis for V. That is, a finite spanning set can be reduced to a basis for the vector space. If the vector space was just the zero vector space, it's spanned by the empty set, and the empty set is a subset of S. So let's start by assuming that S is not empty, and therefore we can let V1 be in S, and we know that the set containing just V1 is linearly independent. Now pick V2 so that the set containing V1 and V2 is linearly independent. We can keep going like this, keep adjoining vectors from S and obtain a linearly independent Li set containing V1, V2, up to, let's say, V sub k. We know this can be done. Now, of course, after the first two in actual practice, you have to test at each stage and make sure that the vector you add is that it keeps the set linearly independent. Now, since S is finite, we know that at some point, adjoining another vector from S will cause the set to be linearly dependent. Unless, of course, S is linearly independent, and in that case, we would add all the vectors of S. But anyway, we reach, we reach a stopping point. Let's say that this stopping point is after the kth vector. We can't find any more vectors in S that will keep the set linearly independent. Let beta be equal to this set. And we must prove that beta is a basis for V. Well, by construction, at each step we, we made sure that the set was linearly independent. That's how we added the vectors. So by construction, beta is linearly independent. We just need to show that the span of beta is equal to V. Instead of taking a vector from V and proving that it is a linear combination of the vectors in beta, I'm just going to pick a vector in S and, and see why that's true. So let's, uh, let's let V be in S, uh, V not in beta, one of, the, one of the vectors in S that we did not adjoin. Well, then this, this vector uh, adjoining, adjoined to beta, see we already tried that in our construction, is linearly dependent because it's a vector of S that we did not adjoin to beta because it would make it linearly dependent. So V then is in the span of beta. It it's, uh, could be written as a linear combination of the V1 through VK. Well, this tells us then that the set S is a subset of the span of beta. But we know that the span of S is equal to V. So when we had a theorem, I think it might have been 1.5, that if S1 is contained in S2, and S1 spans the vector space, and so does S2. So this tells us then that the span of beta is the vector space V. Therefore, beta is a basis.
again, what we just proved is that if you have a finite spanning set, that it can be reduced to a basis. This is just the example he does in the textbook uh, to show you a, a little example of, of uh, the last theorem that we proved in, in an uh, example. Here we have our example in R3. So we want to find uh, a basis. So, well, let's select the first, let's, oh, let's call this V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5. And uh, I won't uh, prove it, but I think you can see that these five vectors uh, span all of R3. Our vector space is three tuples in R3. So we'd like to reduce the set of five vectors to a uh, basis. And you know that the basis will have three vectors in it. We actually haven't proved that yet, but I think you know that. So let's start out and put in the first vector, 2, minus 3, 5. Put in V1. Um, well, oh, V2, look, 4 times 2, 4 times negative 3, 4. So V2 is a multiple of V1. So V1, V2 is not linearly independent, and I won't put that in. But the next one, V3, is certainly not a multiple of V1, so I'm going to put it in uh, here. 1, 0, negative 2. So we're putting in V3. And since 1 is not a multiple of the other, that's linearly independent. Okay, now it would get a little bit trickier. We want to uh, put in another one of these, so let's Let's see, if we put in V4, 0, 2, negative 1, then we have to go to the work of testing these like we have in previous sections of the text. Test and see if there are A1, A2, A3 such that A1, V1 plus A2, V3 plus A3, V4 would if, if we could find a non-trivial solution to that equation set to zero. And you would find that you cannot. We're not going to do that work here. So we would do those calculations and find that this set is linearly independent. And now you have to decide, do we need to put in the vector 7, 2, 0? And you would test and you would see that the vector V5 is a linear combination of V1, V3, and V4. So we don't put in vector 5, and we claim that this would be a basis for R3 because we already know that S spans R3. This theorem called the replacement theorem is um, a very has a very involved proof. It uh, uses induction, and I think that my video will be too long if I do it now. So instead, I'd like to just try to tell you what it means, and we'll start the next video with the proof. Let V be a vector space. I see I've drawn a picture here that is generated by G, so a finite set G. And G, I'm just saying, well, the theorem says it contains exactly n vectors. So I'm just showing you a picture if n was equal to 10. Um, G has 10 vectors in it. And the span of G is all of V. We do not know that G is a basis, but, uh, but it is a spanning set containing, in, in my little example, 10 vectors. And then L is another set. L is a finite set containing exactly M vectors, and it is linearly independent. And I just made up four. I put four vectors in L. Okay, well this theorem tells us two things. It tells us that if L is a linearly independent set and G is a spanning set, that the number of elements in L which he's saying is M, 
the number of elements in L is definitely less than or equal to the number of elements in G. We have to prove that. A linearly independent set will contain less than or equal to the number of elements in any spanning set. And this theorem tells us that if, in my example, it contains four, that we could pick out six, uh, six vectors. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. We could pick out six vectors carefully and put them in, adjoin them with L to make L a spanning set. Notice this doesn't say we're trying to make L a basis. Which, but there are definitely n minus m vectors in G that we could adjoin to L, to, and, and he calls that set uh, H. This would be H here. So that L union H spans all of V. So stay tuned, and the next lecture we will prove this.